Greetings all, I'm Sam Arano, this is Elections Israel, and if you couldn't tell by the title of this video, today I'm going to talk about the recent election that Israel had for a new president. Now, some of you may be saying to yourselves, yes, I know, Naftali Bennett, he replaced Benjamin Netanyahu. Oh, you sweet summer child. No, that is the prime minister. The president is someone else altogether. And while you may not know that much about the presidency, it means a whole lot to Israelis. Israel is what is called a parliamentary republic. This means that while the government is formed by the Knesset with the prime minister as its chief executive, the office of prime minister is purely intended to be an unceremonious administrative job, whereas the true grandeur of the state is vested in a mostly ceremonial president. For English speakers, the closest equivalent I can think of is the Queen of the United Kingdom. Like the Queen, the President of Israel's main job is to be the public face of the nation, which mostly consists of making speeches, having an official photograph displayed in government offices, receiving the credentials of new foreign ambassadors, visiting children in the hospital, that kind of thing. But there are some important differences. Strangely enough, the President of Israel actually has even less official power than most heads of state, including the Queen, because the President of Israel, quite unusually, is not the Commander-in-Chief of the military. In fact, the IDF has no Commander-in-Chief, so if Israel ever has a military coup attempt, nobody has the official power to stop it. Though, if Israel ever reaches the point of having a military coup, we were already in big trouble. On the flip side of that, there is much less of a taboo against using what little power the president actually does have, such as granting presidential pardons and advising and consenting on the formation of a new government. The most obvious differences, however, is that the Israeli presidency is neither hereditary nor a lifetime appointment. On the one hand, this means that the president will always enjoy a great degree of legitimacy by default, and that the existence of the office is unlikely to bother people on principle. On the other hand, this also means that the Israeli president will necessarily be a fairly obscure figure anywhere outside of Israel. Long before we ever met, and long before he ever visited the country, J.J. McCullough made a video in which he presumed that the Israeli president was not a terribly well-known or respected figure. Because they are not as glamorous as kings or queens and don't have any real political power, they are generally not very well-known outside of their countries, or even inside of their countries half the time. And that isn't true at all. But from the outside, I can see how it would seem that way. But more about that later. From its very inception, one of the desired qualities of an Israeli president was not to be a very divisive or partisan figure, and this was engineered into the method by which a president was elected. Some of the specifics have changed, like the length of the presidential term, or whether a president can be re-elected, but I'm going to tell you what the rules are right now, and you can safely assume that most of it has always worked this way. First, a potential candidate for president must announce their intention to run, after which they must secure the approval of at least 10 members of the Knesset. With that completed, the Knesset will vote on the approved candidates. If no candidate receives a majority of the votes, a runoff will be held between the top two candidates. Importantly, the presidential vote is conducted via a secret ballot, unlike any other kind of voting the Knesset does, which helps maintain the generally nonpartisan character of the office. Since the year 2000, the president has been elected to serve a single seven-year term, after which a new president is chosen, though the election could happen earlier if the office is vacated by some unforeseen circumstances. A few weeks later, the new president is sworn in. Sadly, for my love of fanfare and the need for good YouTube content, this is nothing like a presidential inauguration in the U.S. with the public in attendance. It's just a small ceremony performed in the plenum of the Knesset. Now, I hope I've demonstrated that it's seen as very important for the Knesset to keep up appearances by avoiding the election of a president who is seen as too controversial. But at the same time, every Israeli president to date has been a well-known political figure, usually with decades of experience in national office, and every Israeli president has been a member of a political party. So clearly, there's some kind of sweet spot between being too political and not political enough. As you might expect, your chances of being elected president are severely reduced if you've already been prime minister, since that office is almost inherently predisposed to generate controversy. Only one former prime minister, Shimon Peres, has ever been elected president afterward. And even he's a special case because of the circumstances under which he was prime minister, first in the 1980s as part of a national unity government comprising the left-wing alignment and the conservative Likud, and again at the head of a caretaker administration after the very traumatic assassination of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Another rule of thumb when choosing a president is to favor a candidate who, 
to put it bluntly, doesn't have any political future. The usual result of this is to elect a president who is basically too old to return to the political arena in any meaningful way. In the rare occasion that the president has skewed younger, like under 60, that ideal has been undermined. In 1978, Yitzhak Navon was elected president at 57, only to decline re-election after five years and return to the Knesset where he served for an additional nine years. That in itself turned out pretty much okay, but it didn't when Israel's youngest president ever, Moshe Katsav, left office under a cloud of numerous rape allegations for which he was later convicted and imprisoned. As for today, Israel's outgoing president is Reuven Rivlin of the Likud party. Prior to being president, he had been Speaker of the Knesset, and before that had served on and off in the Knesset since 1988. An interesting tidbit for fans of my main channel is that the Rivlin family was one of the very few families who immigrated to Ottoman Palestine during the Napoleonic Wars in accordance with the final wishes of the famous rabbi Eliyahu Zalman, the Vilna Gaon. This makes Rivlin a member of the Old Yishuv, the pre-Zionist Jewish community, which may inform some of his more unusual beliefs. Coming from a very old, established Jerusalemite family, Rivlin has a much more intimate relationship with Arab Israelis and with the Palestinians than most Israeli Jews. On top of that, the President of Israel is allowed to be much more opinionated than most ceremonial heads of state. As a result, Rivlin has been a very outspoken defender of Arabs in general and is one of the few mainstream politicians to support a one-state solution in which Israel and the Palestinian territories would be merged into a single country. The other thing Rivlin has been known for as president is that, despite being a member of the same party as former Prime Minister Netanyahu, they absolutely hate each other. This dates back to at least the 1990s, but the unspoken rivalry between the two has been most visible during Rivlin's presidency, with Netanyahu seeking to get political favors from Rivlin, and Rivlin basically continuously blowing him off. One of the biggest controversies of this presidential vote is the perception that Netanyahu was actively campaigning on behalf of his preferred candidate, Miriam Peretz, in the belief that she might give him a presidential pardon for the various crimes for which he is currently on trial. But if anything, this backfired and Peretz lost the race in a huge landslide to Israel's next president, Yitzhak Herzog Halavi, also known as Buji, which I will not call him. If you know who Yitzhak Herzog is, that he ended up becoming president so overwhelmingly and against Netanyahu's wishes is very funny. During the mid-2010s, Herzog was the leader of the Israeli Labor Party, and essentially, if briefly, transformed it back into a major political party. Of all the people who have challenged Netanyahu for the office of prime minister, Herzog is probably the one that Netanyahu most feared, not because he had the best shot at winning, which he didn't, but because Herzog, even more than Rivlin, and even more than Netanyahu himself, is the most high-born, well-connected legacy figure in mainstream Israeli politics today. Herzog's father, Chaim Herzog, was himself president of Israel from 1983 to 1993, and his grandfather, also named Yitzhak Herzog, was the Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Israel during independence. Before that, he was chief rabbi of Ireland, which in itself isn't so impressive since the Jewish community of Ireland has always been very small, but now President-elect Herzog, as not only Israel's first president from a left-wing party since the 1990s, but also an Irish national, kind of represents the ultimate symbolic nightmare scenario for someone like Netanyahu. As an added bonus, in 2018 Herzog embarrassed Netanyahu in similar fashion when he was elected to lead the Jewish Agency, a quasi-governmental organization that does outreach to Jews worldwide. Netanyahu had lobbied hard to fill the position with a political crony, but because the Jewish agency is one of those weird pre-independence institutions that has eluded the general rightward shift of Israeli politics over the past 50 years, that was never going to happen. As president, I would expect Herzog to take on many of the same issues that he did as a politician and that he did at the Jewish agency, opening up more avenues for the LGBT community in the face of an increasingly draconian orthodox firewall, restoring mutual relations between Israel and American Jews, and generally being more pro-American, pro-Western, pro-multilateral, pro-democracy, and through these overtures, attempt to restore some of Israel's international standing. He's also the first president to be born after Israel's independence, which I think will bring a new and unique perspective. Israel is going through a really weird moment right now, 
where the government is composed of a wild mix of small parties spanning the entire ideological spectrum, and the prime minister is from one of the more minor parties and essentially got his title by giving up any substantive power he might have had. So while he is nominally the chief executive of the government, in essence, we now have two figureheads. Is Israel a shogunate? And in that scenario, I think that the president, while not having any more power than he did before, will play a unique role for the time being and might actually break through that barrier of obscurity and, honestly, I would hope, genuinely be the face of Israel to the world. So Bibi's never getting a pardon.